Okay, welcome back. I hope you had a nice lunch. So, what we'll do today is the more advanced crypto stuff. So, um, yesterday you got kind of basic stuff. So, refreshing of the basic concepts and what you can achieve. So, today we look at more the recent developments because crypto is a fast changing field. I'm not sure I'll be able to cover everything. I have lots of slides, but I guess. I don't think I can do everything, but let's see where we get. So let's we start with encryption, block cypher, stream cyphers, then authentication, hash and Mac. Then I think something very important is modes of operation, authenticated encryption. More technical, so more mathematical, so I may skip some of this, is how to encrypt or sign using RSA. Um, and so RSA dates back to 1977. So you would think that by now we know how to encrypt with RSA. So, and I guess you all know how RSA works. So you just take a plain text M, and to encrypt you raise M to the power E about N, and this gives you the ciphertext. So you would think this is what you do, and to decrypt we say I take C to the power D, where D is a secret mod N, and I get M back. So what is the problem? And the problem is if you implement it like this, it's highly insecure. And you have to do some other stuff. You have to randomize your plain text. You have to add padding and so on. And this appears to be very tricky. I think we now know how to do it, but uh, and there is some standards even explaining how to do it. But the products are about 15 years behind. And there seems to be no movement in there. And if I have time, I'll say something about multi-party computation. Okay. So let's start with block ciphers. So we discussed yesterday that the desk key length is too short, so you move to triple desk. And for technical reasons, you don't use double desk. This is too weak. It only gives you about 10 qubits extra. So two key triple desks where key one is equal to key three gives you about 80-bit security, at least if you have two to the 40 so 1,000 billion or 1 trillion known plain text ciphertext pairs, you can recover the key into the 80 steps. Um, in the banking world, usually only have, say, a few hundred plain text ciphertext pairs, so the security level of two key triple desk is something more like 100 bits. So there is no problem in with this. But so still the US government recommends two key triple desk and say they give it gives about 100 bit security. So but as I will show, it's, or I, I would not show you the details, but I will show you what a related key attack is, and it turns out that in some settings it's a very dangerous attack, and this attack applies to three key triple desks, but not to two key triple desks. So in some sense, against certain attacks, two key triple desks is better than three key triple desks, and against others is the other way around. So there is no simple ranking of crypto algorithms, and depending on which attacks are feasible, an algorithm may be better or worse. So unfortunately, there is no easy answers. So of course, today we have seen a wide migration to AES, and there is only one exception, I would say, which is uh, the financial sector. They're still thinking whether they should go to tricky triple desk or not. So, and I don't think they will move to AES before um, 2020 or so. Um, of course, in the internet banking, they already moved there, and you can see in their backbone network, and I guess more and more they will move there gradually, but at least the basic credit card system and payment system is still um, Triple desk based, I guess contact desk, there is more AES already. Okay. So of course, if you have AES, you don't worry about key search, unless there is quantum computers, that's something we'll discuss later. Now AES, as I showed you yesterday, has three variants. The variant for normal people, which has 10 rounds and a 128-bit key. There is a version for paranoid people, which has a 256-bit key and 14 rounds. <laughs> and then there is also a version we don't know for whom, but an intermediate version with 192-bit keys and 12 rounds. So I think today it's fair to say if we could redesign AES, we would change something. What we would change is how this key, this 128-bit key, is expanded into, in this case, 11 round keys of 128 bits. This key schedule of AES 128 is probably okay, but the one here, which should expand a 256-bit key to 15 128-bit round keys, this key schedule is a bit too lightweight. There is too few operations. It's highly efficient, but in fact it has very few operations 
And I think today we would probably, if we had the choice, put in more. But it's too late. The standard is fixed. We can't change it anymore. Okay. Yes, it's making 11 because one before and then also one after the last round. So it expands this key um, in a very simple algorithm. You XOR some values and once in a while you apply some S-boxes, but it's much more efficient than encryption, the key sketch. Okay. So as I told you, AES is a success. Uh, even in very old hardware, 120 nanometers, you already could get 40 gigabits per second. So you can imagine if you have 23 nanometers, what it can be, right? Very fast. I told you about a new AES instruction of Intel, 0.75 cycles per byte. This is really, 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 really fast. This is faster than you can read from hard disk or SSD. So the best software imp implementation um, when AES was chosen was 15 cycles per byte on a high-end machine. Um, Emilia Casper, my student who now works at Google, and Peter Schwabe um, actually wrote code which takes only eight cycles per byte. In fact, and this code is immune to timing attacks. If you also want to make very compact AES, yes, it's possible too, you can get to about 3,000 gates. Now, I have to be honest, there is now more compact ciphers which are less secure, which fit in about 1,000 to 1,500 gates. So if you really have no gates, you can do better, it's very small area, but then those systems require more energy because they're very slow. They're lower power and fewer gates. So you see that implementation has been a success and adoption has been massive. Um, one year after the publication of a standard, Nicolas Courtois claimed that he could solve the equations of AES um, because AES has a simple algebraic structure at this basis. And so he said there is simple equations and I can solve them. Now, if you reduce AES from 10 rounds to three rounds and from 128 bits to 16 bits, even then Courtois can't solve the equations. So, in fact, this attack doesn't work in spite of all his claims. It was just bluff. Um, if you really want to break AES, you exploit the cache access patterns. So the e efficient software implementations before 2008, they're table-based. So every round you look up one byte and you expand it to 32 bits with the table. And this memory access pattern is dependent on the key. And so in fact, if you have control over the cache, you can check whether the cache is being used or not, certain lines then you can find the key in a very quick time, a few dozen of milliseconds. If you have a competing process or a similar process on the same machine, which is of course a big assumption. If you have a similar process on the same machine, you can do many other bad things maybe. But if you do this, you can actually get the key. So solution is to use time constant implementations without tables. And so the good news is that this bit slice implementation has no tables and it's actually faster. And it's available in um, public domain. It does, it does use all the registers in a clever way, and it, to be honest, you also have to do eight AES at a time. If you only do one AES at a time, it's eight times slower. So it assumes you have to do eight independent operations. You can't use CBC mode with eight blocks. But may, in many cases, this is actually justified. Especially if you want high speed. If you're going to encrypt one block, the speed may not be so critical, right? But if you're going to do many blocks, then you do eight at the same time, and then you want to use this implementation. Yes. Yes, way, no, way more. Way more. Yes. So in fact, we don't know this, right? I mean, there is, you can write these equations. We know that in general, the quadratic equations, so equations which are not linear, but of the form x, i, y, i, so you multiply variables, x, i, y, x, one, y, two, plus x, three, y, 27, plus whatever, you have those kind of equations, and many of them. And so we know that in general, if you pick random equations, they're hard to solve for large, collections. For small collections, they're easy by exhaustive search, but intermediate, nobody knows. And so it's, but it's known that if you would have a large number of equations and a large number of unknowns, then actually those things are actually hard to solve. We know that. But the areas of case equations are not random equations. Are they hard to solve? Well, Coutoua says no, and the rest of the world says yes. But we don't know, to be honest. But by the way, if this attack would work, then dozens of other ciphers would be broken. If you can really solve random or structured quadratic equations, then most hash functions will be broken and most block ciphers will be broken. It's not specific for AES. Then we're really, really in big trouble. Okay. 
Good. And so if you inject false, you also have problems. So if you can actually, um, if you have hard yes, running in hardware or software and you can inject false, for example, you can shine with a laser um, on the chip and you can make errors in the computation, then you can, from the result, the, the wrong result, you can easily deduce the key. So this is also a problem. You have to make sure that your result is correct. So a recent development, well, recent is a couple of years ago. Um, so if you're really paranoid, if you want to encrypt top secret information or you think that your secrets are so important, you use AES-256, the long version. Now, key search you're not going to be able to do, right? I mean, 264 you can do in 10 minutes, so 64-bit key with $5 million, an 80-bit key in two years with $5 million, and a 120-bit key will take 1 billion years with $5 billion. This budget is a bit too much even for NSA and one billion years. Nobody wants to wait as long for one plain text. Right? It's a bit too long. And so even if you apply Moore's law for 10 more years, it's going to be a bit more cheaper, a factor of hammer cheaper, but people will still not care. And this is only 2 to the 120. And this is 2 to the 256. Okay. So there is kind of a big security margin here. Okay. So what Bilyakov and Kovatovic found in 2009 is a related key attack on AES-256. I will explain to you what it is, okay? And this attack requires 2 to the 119 encryptions with four related keys. So, and people say now AES-256 is broken because 2 to the 119 is a lot smaller than 2 to the 256. But also, if you spend $5 billion, you build a parallel machine with probably a million processors. While here, all these encryptions have to be done with the same chip. So by the time you are done, the Earth have been have absorbed by the sun for a long time already. So you shouldn't really worry too much about this, okay? But on the other hand, mathematically, this is smaller, so we say there is an attack, okay? So it works because of the lightweight key schedule. So is this broken? No, I say it's an academic weakness. <coughs> and there is an easy way to fix it. I will show you how to fix it. There is no implications on AS-128. And so the main recommendation is do not use the large key length in a hash function construction, which I guess you should not use high friction based on block size. This is so 80s that you should stop doing this. Okay? It was a good practice in 80s and early 90s, but we now have good hash functions, so you don't need to construct hash functions based on block size. This is anyway bricolage. Um, you shouldn't do this anymore. So, so do not use AS 256 in a hash function construction. <coughs> so there is this kind of ways. I think there is a bank standard from IBM that uses DES to hash. And so some people, they're too lazy or they don't have enough uh, RAM or ROM to implement an extra hash function. And so if you have a small input and you want to hash this, you can quickly cook something together from a block cipher. Okay? What we know today is that you should not use AES-256 in such a construction. But it's, I, I don't think it's done very frequently. And I guess you've now been warned, don't do this. Okay, so what is related key attack? This is the attack here, related key attack. So it's a very special attack. You have a box with the key. Of course, you can't see the key because if you knew the key, then you wouldn't have to attack things. So you can give this box plain text and get cipher texts, many of them. And then at some moment, you're allowed to have magic powers and you're allowed to change the key in the box. In a specific way you choose, you can XOR a value to it. Okay. So this is this symbol, you XOR a constant C to the key, and then you encrypt more, okay? For this attack, they have to do this three times, so they have to change the key three times in a particular way, and every time they have to do about two to the 118 encryptions, which is really a long, long time, okay? So if you can do this, then you can find uh, the key back, okay? So should you worry about this? So personally, I think that if you have a key in a device and you allow the opponent to XOR things into the key, then you're in trouble, okay? If you give the opponent access to your key and allow him to change things, then you're really in trouble. But there is some exceptions. Um, and one is um, some US banking standards. In some US banking standards to generate a session key, you just XOR a counter into the key. So in fact, by construction, you have related keys. Now, of course, there is no reason to assume that this counter will be exactly the constant you need for the attack to work, but okay, it's kind of bad. And the second thing is a 
invention from IBM, which I think IBM now deeply regrets, but it's a great patent. So to save on keys in a hardware security module, so you have, of course, key encrypting keys, you have MAC keys, you have pin encrypting keys, you have master keys. To save on key storage, they only store one key, and to generate different keys, keys variants, the XOR a control vector into the key. And this control vector says what the key is good for. So if you XOR pin, it becomes a pin encrypting key. Or you XOR MAC, it becomes a, a MAC key. And so, of course, if you have control vectors, this is perfect for related key attacks. Okay, and this is the kind of thing which is implemented in quite some IBM banking products. But on the other hand, if you're not in those two special cases, which should be NSE le anyway legacy and we should no longer do, you actually are already making big mistakes. Now I have a puzzle for you. So in the related key attacks, which I show you, which are the most standard ones, you can XOR a constant to the key. Now what if you can not XOR a constant, but you can AND a constant to the key? Not XOR, but AND, okay? If you can do this, well, you can end with 96 zeros and then 32 one bits. And if you do this now, then the key suddenly becomes 32 bits and you can do it by exhaustive search, right? So you find 32 bits of the key. You can do this a few times and then you have the whole key into the 32. So you see, if you allow the opponent to play with your key, you actually are in big, big trouble, okay? So for XOR, there is an attack not necessary. For AND, there is not even a brain necessary. You can do this. You could even do it bit by bit, right? So then there is no real difficulty. Now, if you're still worried, um, then you redefine your API for AES-256. And what you do is you put here a hash function like SHA-256 or CATCHAC. And so you use the key. And then you actually hash it. And only then do you input it to AES. Why does it stop the attack? Because, well, in this way, you can never get the required differences here. Because for a good hash function, it's infeasible to find which keys you have to apply to get the right difference here. And so if you would really leave you asleep about this, well, just hash your key before you use it, and then you stop this. Okay, but you shouldn't really worry about this anyway, because my story about the Earth and the Sun, remember, 2 to the 119. But it's an attack. And so it shows that against the key attack, um, AES-256 is weaker than AES-128 because AES-256 is a larger key, so by changing stuff, you can influence more in the engine. That's more or less the intuition. So this is the attack here. So the security level is 256 bits. That's the aimed security level. This is 14 rounds. So the security level is not 256, but it's only 119. And if you use the number of rounds, you see if you would use, say, eight rounds, the attack becomes really practical. But there is no problem because AES-256 does not have eight rounds. It has 14 rounds, okay? But I guess it's kind of cool that you can break eight rounds of AES-256. Now, there is another block cipher which is vulnerable to such an attack, which is Kazumi. And you all know Kazumi because it's in your pocket, or you should know it, because in your 3G phone, there is Kazumi in hardware, okay? And so Kazumi is a version of MISTI, and MISTI-1 is a Japanese cipher, and the Japanese word for MISTI is Kazumi. So, and Kazumi is kind of a weakened version of MISTI. The key schedule was simplified to make it faster. And so Kazumi has only eight rounds. And so Dunkelmann, Keller, and Shamir showed two years ago, two and a half years ago, that with four related keys and two to the 26 data, they can actually recover the key. So in fact, there the attack, I would say, is practical. <coughs> but on the other hand, nobody cares because um, in the 3G setting, related key attacks make no sense whatsoever because in 3G, your session key is sent to your phone, which is not trusted anyway. So somehow, an attacker who can modify this key can just also grab this key, right? I mean, there is no point. We don't trust this thing. Uh, and the way Kazumi is used in 3G, uh, you, in the other ways, you can't actually uh, exploit this thing. But it's kind of undesirable, and if we could redesign Kazumi, we would change the key schedule. I think it's the same thing is true for AS-256. If the AES designers had the choice, they would change the key schedule. But they don't have a choice. It's too late, OK? So there is no concern, but I guess it's interesting attack. So and then one and a half year ago, there was a new announcement to a real attack on AES-256, but even on AES-128. But the attack is really marginal. It's called the big click attack. Um, it's a nice technique to speed up exhaustive search. 
but you see the speed up is only a factor of four, so you can gain two bits. And in fact, you can gain two bits for almost any block cipher. And you need two to the 88 plain text ciphertext pairs first, which is a very large number. Again, collecting those will take you about the time, the earth, and so on. You know the story, right? So, and anyway, so maybe you can just rename it AS126 and then you're okay. <laughs> so nobody cares, right, about losing two bit security because, I mean, the attack is now a bit older, but already in the beginning, the uh, attacker said, we don't see any way to extend it. It's really just an optimization trick of exhaustive search. That's what it is. It's not like a generic technique that allows you to cut off key bits. And so it works slightly better for AS92 and even better for AS256. There you only need two to the 40 plain text ciphertext pairs. But I mean, who cares whether you can cut three bits of 256 bits? It's even less relevant. Okay, but this, mathematically, you can say the algorithm is broken. This is a mathematical attack. Okay. But again, this attack applies to many other block ciphers. Good. Now, stream ciphers, we discussed this yesterday. Um, what is new there? I guess not so much has happened. So in our pockets, we have LFSR-based A51 and A52 and E0. They're all practically broken, real efficient attacks. Um, in our browsers, we still have RC4 and probably notice nodes as well. There is serious weaknesses, so try not to use it. Um, and then you can use a block cipher as a stream cipher, but this is not really, um, I would say, interesting because you don't get a better performance than a block cipher. So there is many schemes that are broken. And the ones that are not broken are in an ISO standard, Snow 2.0. And Mugi Mugi is uh, designed by Hitachi and my group. Um, and they're both in an ISO standard. Um, but in general, there is not enough standards and open solutions. Yes, Thomas. So RC4 was less as uh, more like the only code in the As strong as the advice, I mean, it's not your own risk, right? There is bias. I mean, you leak information on your plain text, essentially. And there is weak keys. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, there, there is a lot of, but there is also the, the second derivative of the sequence is bias and so on. You leak information on your plain text. I think this is the typical reaction of the industry is, um, you say this is an attack, but how bad is it? You, as a researcher, first prove, prove me a case where you can really make damage and then we'll, have, we'll go to a better algorithm. Okay? I think we should, in security, um, be much more effective in discarding weak algorithms. Um, for example, also for, for SSL TLS, there is many dozen flaws have been found, but action is only taken if the flaw is really big. Okay? And so, in fact, what the SSL people expect is that as cryptographers, we're going to spend all our time to show that a crack is really a big crack or that a small hole can be made bigger, okay? But it's, I think it's very easy. If you have a woolen sweater and you cut a few wires in there, okay, after a while these wires will become unloose and the whole thing will untie. Why should you take the risk, right? Especially if there is easy fixes. So I think it's actually an insult to cryptographers to insist that they spend their time on first finding problems and then making the attacks based on those problems practical, right? I think that's a waste of, of valuable time of cryptographers. If you find a problem, fix it, okay? That should be the attitude in my view. And so this is typical. There is now a good stream cipher, there is authenticated encryption, fixed TLS, right? I mean, why is RC4 still in there? There is no reason whatsoever. So GSM, um, I told you that there is practical attacks. So the mathematical attack um, requires a few seconds, but it requires so also a few seconds of non plain text, so a few thousand frames while the attack by null only requires two or three frames of non plain text, or ciphertext only, sorry, it's even better. So you can actually, at this URL, get the rainbow tables for time memory trade off, and with those tables, you can decrypt in a few seconds. So in GSM, as I told you yesterday, it's harder to get the signal than to decrypt. Okay? So A52 is broken in milliseconds, um, it's withdrawn 2007. Um, and A53 seems to be okay, but it's only used in, say, about half the handsets and maybe only a small percentage of base stations has been upgraded because this is really expensive. So if you want to attack GSM, you just eavesdrop after the base station. There, everything is in clear, much easier. You can just tell phones to switch off encryption. 
And most phones don't tell you encryption is switched off. When I buy a phone, I always try to find, the f uh, find phones which tell me that encryption is switched off, so I can at least know that encryption is switched off. And I have seen this happen in Paris during the bombing attacks in the late 90s. I've seen encryption switch off in Beirut. I've seen encryption switch off in Tehran. I've seen encryption switched off in India. That's the places where I've seen it. But I also have friends in the mobile industry, and they tell me the following. If your phone says encryption is switched off, then it's switched off. If your phone tells encryption is on, then you don't know. <laughs> That's the feature you get. And most phones don't tell you at all. They don't have this thing because it's kind of too, it's something that fell off the specs. They forgot to put it in, you know, sorry. Yes. From a lawful detection point of view, when you flip on phone encryption, is that, is that, uh, is that loud when you do that? How do you make sure you do that? I mean, you, it's not your choice. The base station chooses. The operator chooses whether encryption is on or off. You can't choose. So I, I can only give an indication to the user. Okay, that's what, you can only have, an indication, okay? You don't have a choice. No, you cannot say, I don't want it. Your, your base station tells you, use this. So you don't, have, you don't have many options. And there is still, of course, SMSs of death that, that can um, break your phone. They still exist, amazingly. Anyway, so more recent developments is two years ago, in fact, uh, people said we have more and more tools to intercept signals and then oh, one and a half year ago at Black Hat, so somebody showed this fantastic um, Motorola phone and this phone, they managed to hack the firmware because in fact GSM signal is frequency hopping, so it's kind of hard to trace it. But of course every phone can do it, otherwise you couldn't place calls. And so what Noel and his colleagues managed to do is to hack the firmware of this phone and of course they can use this phone to grab signals of the air and intercept any phone call. And then they can use their rainbow <laughs> tables to decrypt in a few seconds. So it's kind of hard to check before you do it yourself, but there is a clear indication that this works because as soon as this attack was published on eBay, these phones became very expensive. <laughs> so everybody wants to have them to start eavesdropping on calls. Of course this is very, very illegal to do this, right? So I guess it's kind of interesting, so banks switch to two-factor authentication and SMS and people have a good feeling and say it's a second channel. Well, if you see how easy it is to hack, you should maybe think twice, right? At least if somebody's really motivated, he may be able to decrypt or inject SMSs um, into the system. For LTE, so also known as 4G, the Chinese have said, we want our own algorithm um, and they, there is a policy phrased that every algorithm used in China needs to be designed in China. Um, I think they're coming a little bit back from this as far as I recently heard. So I think the, the view is now that they will have alternatives for every algorithm, a Chinese alternative, but they will also allow non-Chinese algorithms. Um, so this was a design which is more or less uh, based on Snow 3G, but with some variants and improvements. So initially they made some flaws and the design was fixed. And if you want more comments, um, I can happy to give them online, but not on tape. So in order to improve, improve the state of the art of stream ciphers, um, in 2003 and four, we had the idea of launching a kind of open competition in Europe. So I was running a network of excellence called eCrypt, and we organized a competition called eStream. And we identify two areas where stream ciphers can win over AES, which is in software, if you have high volumes. So we believe that if you are pure in software, you can gain a factor three or four over AES. And then you can improve throughput over area in um, hardware, especially if you're area constrained or throughput constrained, stream ciphers can beat AES. Um, so it was kind of interesting. We got 33 submissions. Most were broken in the first year. Then we, people were allowed to fix them and resubmit. And was quite some excitement. And so at the end, we published eight quote unquote winners, um, four in the software category and four in the hardware category. I never particularly liked this one and one year after the announcement, it was actually broken. So this is not like the US government. The US government says we want a new standard. They organize a competition and everybody submits and the US said this is the winner. So we feel in Europe, we don't have the cloud because eCrypt is academics. It's not the government involved. So we don't have the cloud or the political force to impose algorithms. 
But so the idea was let's recommend some promising algorithms and let them go to standard bodies. And this is what has happened. So ISO has standardized actually grain and trivium recently, uh, and I think also HC and Rabbit. So, so Semanuk, I would say, is the less elegant design, and Rabbit is patented. So HC is the fastest one. So HC is kind of the 32-bit version of RC4. Um, it's designed by a very bright old student of mine, Hong Jung Wu. And so Hong Jung Wu is only also the only person who managed to get an algorithm in the SHA-3 finals as a single designer. So he's a really, really bright guy. And so HC is encrypting at three cycles per byte. So it's about two to three times faster than AES uh, in software. And Salsa, I think, is also a cool design. But so Rabbit, because the patent is probably less popular. So I guess what you should remember is HE and Salsa and Grain and Trivium. So you see here, for RC4 and HC, you do pay a price. So, so you see that triple death is about this is an old machine, but it doesn't matter that much. These, these factors don't change that much. So DES is about 40 cycles per byte. Triple DES is about 110. So the more cycles per byte, the slower. Um, AES is about 7 to 15. On this machine, will be more 15, I think. Um, RC4 is about 10, and HC is about 3. Now, you don't get this completely for free, because before you can start encrypting, RC4 needs about 12,000 cycles, and HC needs about 30,000 cycles. So if you're going to encrypt a file of 100 bytes, there is no point in using HC to be faster. Okay? But if your file is a megabyte, you will win with HC. Okay, so we move on to hash functions. So I told you yesterday about the hash function crisis. Okay? And I'll speak more about the answer. But so already in 1993, Anton Bosselaars and Bertun Boer found problems with MD5. And the reaction of the industry was, so what? You can't demonstrate a real attack. In 1996, Dobertin found more serious problems, and the reaction of the industry was, well, it's not a real collision, who cares? And then in 2004, Professor Wang found collisions in 15 minutes for MD5. And the response of the industry was, this is interesting, we probably have to get rid of MD5. 2004, okay. In 2008, there was a team of researchers who launched an attack on CAs that were still using MD5. Okay, this is four years after the announcement of the Wang attack. And so what they essentially managed to do is to um, create a rogue CA. So they submitted a user key, a user public key for a signature. But in fact, on beforehand, they produced a collision between a user key and a CA key. So certain bits in a certificate say whether a key is a user key or a CA key. So you limit or extend the power by setting certain bits. And so they created a collision with under MD5 um, of two keys. One is a normal user key, and the other one is a CA key. And so the attack succeeded. And so by submitting the user key, they now have a CA key. So in fact, these hackers own a private key. And with this key, they can sign any other server certificate. In fact, they can subvert the whole SSL mechanism by themselves. So you can see that governments would like to do this, right? It's cheaper than buying an, their own CA and getting approval, OK? So the attack is more tricky than you think it is, because at the moment the certificate authority issues a search, it computes or it gives you a serial number. And so at the moment you create this message, this key, you don't know the number. So you, what they did was they tried to look at the behavior of the CA, and this, this CA was linear numbers. And so they could try to predict which number they would get, and then they would be able to produce a collision. So it took them a few times. So the interesting thing was that four years after the MD5 attack, and 15 years after the first MD5 attack, there were still six CAs issuing MD5 certs. And of course, once the attack was known, they only took three months to get rid of it. So of course, they had many legacy systems, and I guess the users kept probably pushing them for MD5, but I guess now they got rid of it. At least as well, we thought that they got rid of this. Because Microsoft made a very important announcement in, MD, um, in 2004. In 2004, Microsoft says, we have actually 800 uses of Windows, uh, of MD5 in Windows, 800. And so we have hired a person, and his job title is the MD5 removal person. <laughs> and this person has a task for the next years to remove MD5 from all products. Okay. Did this person succeed? 
This person failed. And I guess he now his job title is a SHA-1 removal person. I don't know. <laughs> so what was discovered last May, which is brand new, is that there was a variant of Stuxnet and Duku, of, or a variant of a successor, called Flame. It was discovered by, a cer by the CERT in Iran. It was targeting cyber espionage in Middle Eastern countries. <coughs> had several vectors for propagation, recorded all your screenshot, keyboard activity, and network traffic, including Skype. Had a kill command to wipe out its traces. So I guess the only mistake that the US government did, or excuse me, uh, the government that wrote this thing did, is they forgot to wipe it out before discovery. If there would have been one month earlier, nobody would have heard of it, okay? So now what is cool about Flame, that it uses an MD5 collision attack. So in fact, Flame does the same thing, okay, as what these guys did, but the cool thing is it's a completely new difference pattern. So it's a, a differential pattern which the academic community had not discovered yet. So it's a new attack on MD5, this is not done by some hackers in a basement. This is done by a government, which has capitalists with great tools and years of experience. Okay, so you get governments going after governments. So, and what it turns out that MD5 was still used um, in the Microsoft Enforced Licensing Intermediate PCA. I'm not a real expert in this Microsoft stuff, but apparently it's used for Windows updates. So Windows update was still based on MD5 in 2012. So a big failure of the MD5 removal person. Maybe they were told not to remove this. Maybe that's another thing. Okay, I shouldn't suggest this. This is paranoid, but maybe, you know, you don't know. So I told you this morning about DigiNotar and how the Iranian opposition was being targeted. So essentially DigiNotar was hacked, fake certificates were generated for Google and others, and then the opposition was tricked into using those certificates to accept fake servers. Okay? So the response to Flame was that Microsoft no longer supports RSA keys open than 1024 bits. And so NIST, in fact, should get rid of those by the end of this year. So I guess there will also be factorization attempts. Um, then we had the Adobe problem, similar certificate problem in last September. So what is this problem? Okay, it's a very important problem. And I guess it's not stressed enough. Um, and I think it's maybe the cryptographer's fault because we don't explain people enough about this problem. So you have the CA key, and the CA key is extremely valuable, right? It's expensive and valuable because it's your business. As a CA, if you lose this key, you're really out of business. Did you know there is an example of it? In fact, you don't have to lose the key, you have to lose control of the key. So, but to protect the key, you'll put it in an HSM, and these HSMs are pretty expensive, right? It's not just a cheap thing, this is an expensive piece of equipment with temper protection, okay? That's not enough, you're going to put it in a building, you're going to put machine guns and dogs, and you're going to put all the things around it. Um, you may put it in the basement and whatever to secure it. But of course, every day a CA has to sign keys because this is how they make money. Or at least they have to sign revocation lists, or they have to sign OCSP responses. So in fact, what sits there is a normal PC, and this PC submits files for signature, right? Or for decryption or whatever it is that the CA is doing today. So if you can hack this machine, it doesn't really matter what happens here, okay? If you have control over the insecure machine, this is a big problem. It's the same with a smart card, right? You can say, I, I'm secure because I have a smart card for all my transactions. Well, if you address a smart card over the insecure PC, the, the, the malware takes control of your machine and does what it has to do, okay? So even if this connection is secure, it doesn't matter if you can break the endpoint. So I guess at least you should be using a smart card here. But even then, if this machine is compromised, it's not going to help you, okay? So I think if you like Magritte, I think what you should remember is CNAP has an HSM. So in fact, you have your key in an HSM, but the way where you get the signals from, the place where you get the signals from is not an HSM. And of course you can say, let's put an HSM here, but it doesn't solve the problem because then you have to control this from another machine. So I guess we should be building HSMs with user interfaces. That's what we should be doing. But can we make something secure with user interfaces, right? That's, I guess that's the big question. So this is what happened in the DigiNotar case. In fact, this server didn't have firewall, antivirus or anything, and it was compromised. And then you can sign any certificate you want. Okay, so, this is a very busy slide. Um, it just shows you the academic community is very busy. 
Um, this is the trend toward lightweight crypto. So what you see here is gate equivalence. So the more to the right, the bigger the design. This is 6,000 gate, this is 1,000 gates. And what you see here is speed, throughput in kilobits per second, um, happen to be at a very slow clock, but of course this is scales very easily. Okay? So you see AES is about 5,000 gates and gives you about 50 kilobits per second. There is more compact implementation, which are even slower. Okay? So what researchers have been doing to keep themselves busy in the last five years is designing lightweight ciphers that fit in less than 3,000 gates. And we've been very successful here. There is a whole series of designs. And all these designs are kind of very compact, but not so fast. In general, they're also less secure than AES. They have shorter keys, most of them. And they have smaller block lengths. Now, what you see here in blue is very cool. You see some stream ciphers, which are actually implemented in a special way, kind of eightfold parallelism. And so you see the stream ciphers are still compact, not as compact as the smallest block ciphers, they're like 2,000 gates, but they're actually 10 times faster. So if you want a very high throughput over areas, stream ciphers will beat AES and all these other things in the zoo here by a factor of 10. And so for wireless video encryption, um, which especially with high definition, high rate video encryption, um, you will actually start switching to those things for energy consumption and for speed. So now the hash function story. You know what the hash function is, so I should not say too much about it. So most of the problems have come with collision resistance, right? This is the first property. It should be hard to find two distinct inputs with the same output. So here you see the security level in bits or the effort in two to the number of bits for a collision attack. So let's start with MD4. MD4 has claimed security 2 to 64 or 64 bit security against collisions. So within a few years after its announcement, Hans Dobertin found collisions in 2 to the 20, which is a few milliseconds. Um, and Professor Wang found collisions for MD4 by hand. Okay. And 4 is broken by hand. So MD5, um, I told you there were first attacks in this area, in this period, in the mid 90s, but they were not full attacks. They were on variants or they had some, they had to change some things of MD5. But there were clear warnings there was a problem, but they were all ignored by the industry. And so in 2004, Professor Wang published her attack, 15 minutes, and today we're also down to the level of the millisecond and sub-millisecond. And so thanks to the flame designers, we have a new attack on MD5, which uses different techniques than what we have today. US government, of course, does much better. They have SHA-0. US government published SHA-0 in 92 and said MD5 is the work of an amateur. They refer to Ron Rivest as an amateur and say, we're the professionals, trust us, we know what we're doing. Um, today, SHA-0 can be broken in an hour. In fact, the US government found their own problems with SHA-0. Yeah. In 93, they actually issued a new standard called SHA-1. They never told us why, but I think we know now why. Okay, so they were a bit ahead in cryptanalysis, <coughs> but I don't think we should trust them. Professor Wang found collisions for SHA-1, or at least an attack, in something like 2 to the 60. So it's also a million times weaker than before. So you can see there was kind of some panic in the US government about SHA-1. The Wang attack takes 2 to the 69 steps, so which is actually a big improvement over 2 to the 80. Um, and since then, there have been many attacks published that all claim something like 2 to the 60. <laughs> but as far as I know, none of these attacks work. And nobody wants to tell what they're doing because they all want to be famous and produce the first collision for SHA-1. And so anyway, people have been working on other stuff like SHA-3. But so um, every time I give talks since 2005, I say that in the next year, I expect a collision for SHA-1. Because I think today it can be really done, but it never happens. So you can be sure the US government has one, okay? If they need to do it, they'll have one. Um, but so what is my prediction? Well, I'll do it one last time. I think this time I'm really right. Next year, we get a collision for SHA-1. I really think it will happen. Okay. I think one of the reasons why I think it will happen is that um, a Dutch designer, Mark Stevens, has finally published all this code online. And so this may inspire some other researchers to start working on it more and to build on this. And so I think finally somebody has given up the secrecy and said, here are, here are all my ideas. This is what I can do. This makes it more likely some other people will build on this. But of course, those that do will not talk. So next week, I'm going to a conference in Singapore 
I definitely be trying to find out who is working on those collisions. So m my prediction will be more accurate. I will know more in a week from now whether or not people are still working on it or not. Okay? Outside the US government, obviously. So US government actually had an answer in place to SHA the one problem, which is SHA2. SHA2 is an algorithm designed by NSA, the people who brought us SHA0 and SHA1. So obviously, they're very competent in hash function design. Um, their designs only get broken after a few years, so it's not too bad. So there was clearly a kind of doubt in the US, should we trust SHA2? Because you know all of these algorithms seem to be broken, and even the NSA seems to not be capable of designing good hash functions. So NIST, the US standards body, had two options, do nothing and hope that everything will be fine, or organize a competition. And in the end, they decided to organize a competition for SHA3. But so just for the record, SHA2 is not broken. Okay, So we've been making progress on SHA2, a bit more than expected, but still SHA2 is also secure. This was big fun. This is like the Olympic Games for cryptographers, but only they happen once every 20 years or 15 years. So we had 64 submissions in 2008. 51 were admitted. Then after nine months, they chose 14. Then after another year in 2010, they chose five. And then last October, the winner was announced. So if you look at the original slide, the designs came from all over the world. And most of the attacks came out of Europe. And we broke most of the other schemes. So after a few rounds, in fact, most of the schemes left were from Europe. This is a company in Asia working with us. Hitachi, we have, so part of the designers is from Kozik. This is my old student. This is how Asia survived the competition. And so the US still had three. And the big winner was France with five designs in, or four designs in round two. Okay, and then came the final. So the big loser was France because there was no France finalist. And so US kept one and the other three were from Europe. But I guess this guy got his PhD here, so you can call him half European, right? So, US one, sorry? Then why? If it's US one in Pacific Ocean, then why? Skyn, this, this is Skyn, this is Bruce Nair, my, Mihir Bellare, Intel is involved, Doug Whiting, yes. It's, it's a whole team, a very big team. This is also, this is one guy. Eh? So it's kind of more impressive, he did everything by himself. This is a team of like seven people or eight people. That's how the US could survive. <laughs> I think in the end, um, this is performance data, very cool, um, from the eBash website. So you see here the high-end machines and the low-end machines. This is a log scale, so if you have about th this, this arrow should have come out a bit lower. So this is about a factor three slower. So you see that everything is in a factor three. You see, for example, that the green thing, which is Grustel, is a bit slower, and that the blue and the red, which is um, Skein and Blake, are a bit faster. But on the Small embedded processes is actually the, the story changes a bit. Okay, so there is no clear winner except for Skane and Blake, you would say, are the high end software winners. Now, in hardware, this is the same graph throughput area, but this is not compact stuff, this is 40,000 gates. Remember, a few slides ago, we were looking at like 4,000 gates or 3,000 gates, so this is 40,000. This is throughput, uh, but a much higher clock speed, obviously. So you see here is Skane, Blake, GH. This is the Asian design. So they're actually reasonably compact, but quite slow. Brustel is two times bigger, but also more than two times faster. And then Ketchak is the same size and 10 times faster. So you see in hardware, Ketchak is a clear winner. It stands out and it's way better. And there is, I think the only one which was a bit competitive was Lufa. This is the Lufa design. This is the design done by Kosik. Uh, together with Hitachi. And this is a design by an ex cosmic So you see that in hardware design, the Belgians seem to be the winners, right? We're the only ones who can make decent crypto hardware or hardware, crypto designed for hardware. So the winners in the end are Ketchak. So this is Johan Damen. This is also the designer of AES. Um, Michael Peters, Guido Bertoni, he's Italian. He's kind of the only non-Belgian who ever won a US algorithm competition. Um, and <laughs> this is Gilles Van Asch. So I'm not going to explain you how it works, but the, the algorithm is simple and elegant. So it's highly structured and has simple operations. Um, it works on a kind of 3D matrix where AES is 2D, this is 3D. Um, and there's some simple operations, so five simple operations, which are combined and then repeated um, 24 times. 
So next week, the best attack on Kachak will be presented. And the best attack until recently was two rounds or three rounds out of 24. And next week, it will be improved to five rounds out of 24. To give you an idea, for SHA-2, we can break about 55 to 57 out of 80, or out of 64. So there, the gap is much smaller. Security margin is a lot larger for Kachak. So this is the end of the competition. I, I, I guess everybody's happy with the decision. Uh, one of the reasons they also chose Kachak, I believe, is that SHA-2 is actually also in this area. It's more SHA-2, like Blake and Skane, uses what we call ARX, Addition Rotate XOR. In fact, the three operations which the Intels and the AMDs want to make very fast. Because if you look at what the processor is doing, most of the time it's adding, rotating, or XORing stuff. So the strategy followed by SHA-2, also, in fact, the ID comes from MD4, MD5, comes from REVEST. But this strategy has been followed by SHA-1, by RIPE-MD, um, by SHA-2, by Blake, by SCAN, is to let's use in our algorithm as much addition rotate XOR as possible because then it will be fast on high-end processors, because Intel and AMD, they invest lots of time and effort in making addition fast. Okay? And so this, this means that unless you use um, ARX, is the only way you can really be the fastest on those machines. As cryptanalysts, we don't like ARX because they're very hard to analyze. So there is, mathematically, it's very hard to analyze carries, and so this is why it takes so long to understand the security. Okay? So... <coughs> I think that's the reason why Blake and Skane didn't win. They were too similar to SHA-2. So it became also obvious today that SHA-2 is unbroken. So the US government doesn't want a second SHA-2 lookalike. If SHA-2 would have been broken, I think Blake and Skane would probably have won because they're faster on high-end machines, which is a high priority for some application cases. But because we have SHA-2 and US government now seems to like it again, um, Blake and Skane were kind of in not good shape. Um, GH was not extremely good in performance, had some minor security weaknesses, and Gristle, as you see, it's on the right, it's kind of a bit slower in software, and in hardware, it's not very compact. And I think that's the reason why, in the end, it wasn't picked. So but I think everybody agrees that Ketchak is a good choice, um, but Kerberkeptamilus is also very interesting because it's a very new design, and so we have to develop new techniques. So I do think that in a few years we'll be able to break 10 rounds. That's my prediction. 10, 12, I think it's feasible. Okay. So, and as implementers, Ketchak is really easy to implement. So you just have to implement five permutations on the state. And in fact, everything is word oriented. So you can just put your words in the right way and everything is very simple. So it's designed to be actually quite efficient in software. So, what is the conclusion for implementers without caring about cryptanalysis? So until 2001, we lived in this world. This is again speed in cycles per byte. So the higher, the slower. So we lived in a world where encryption takes 35 cycles per byte, while hashing takes 3, 5, 10, 12, 14 cycles per byte. So we live in a world, the whole 90s, we lived in a world where encryption is slow and hashing is about 10 times faster. Okay? So at the same time, encryption moved from hardware to software. All the clients, all the hosts on the internet started doing encryption in software. So it's not a surprise that Microsoft and the IETF have built the whole crypto infrastructure around MD5 and SHA-1 and not around DES. Because using DES meant first you had export problems and second you're 10 times slower. So this explains why Microsoft Windows has 800 users of MD5, or had 800 users of MD5. Okay. So now we live in a very different world. AES is now 7 cycles per byte. And the hash functions which we have, even Ketchak, are more 15. 12, 15, 20. This is the range. It's a bit old implementations. We can now do better. And so Ketchak is also in this range. So we now live in a world where encryption with AES is fast, and hashing is kind of slowish. It's 15 cycles per byte. And of course, if you have the AES instruction, AES is 0.75 cycles per byte. So on an Intel processor or an AMD processor, in fact, encryption is 20 times faster than hashing. So we should rethink all our internet crypto and all our crypto decisions because we have to dump hashing and switch back to AES. 
And it's a very difficult thing to do because IETF doesn't think like this. They just don't want to change stuff. And they say, is it broken? Then we don't fix it. It's not broken, we don't fix it. They always, claim about, they always complain about performance problems. But if you have a solution to their problem, they say, no, no, but it's too expensive to change things. That's more or less the state of the art today. So what about Mac algorithms? I won't say too much about it. But so on, for AES, you have Emac, which is the one I like. NIST has CMac, which is a bit more tricky to implement and has some potential weaknesses. Um, the internet is still infested with HMAC based on MD5 and SHA-1. I'm not a big fan of HMAC, but HMAC SHA-1 is probably still secure. Um, Intel seems to be pushing GMAC and NIST with them. And then some people push UMAC, but I don't particularly think it's a very good algorithm. It's very fast, it's basically fast, but it has also, you, you pay some security price for this speed. Now, you actually don't want Max and you don't want encryption. The problem is that you didn't know what you wanted. But I will tell you what you need and what you wanted. What you want is authenticated encryption. In fact, there is no real good case to conceive where you want only encryption and authentication. If you can find one, please tell me. But I've never ever seen a convincing case where you say I want to encrypt but not authenticate data. The problem was that we didn't have a good solution, so today we have uh, many solutions, uh, and NIST has pushed two, CCM and GCM. And both of them are kind of imperfect compromises. So CCM is the counter mode, which is nice, because counter mode allows for parallelism, and it's, it's efficiently, efficiently implementable. But the problem is that it uses CMAC in combination, and CMAC does not allow parallelism. So CMAC is inherently serial. Plus, this is two times slower than encrypting. Plus, not parallelizable. Then you have GCM. GCM uses counter, which is parallelizable, and GMAC, which is also parallelizable. Um, but GMAC is not so fast in software. It's about 30 to 50 percent the time of encryption. Um, but unless you use the Intel instruction, then it's a bit better. But as I will show you, there are some minor security flaws. And uh, maybe they will get bigger. There is other solutions like OCB, OCB mode. But OCB mode suffers from a very important attack. It's known as the patent attack. So the patent attack is, I have a patent that applies to your, your scheme. And if you dare to use it, then I will sue you, and you will sue him. And it will be an endless legal debate for 10 years. And so this is why nobody dares to touch OCB. So there is essentially three or four patents, one by Gligor and Doneshku, Popescu, and they, for the patent authenticated encryption, there is one by IBM called IAPM, and by Utla, which also has authenticated encryption, and the fastest one is OCB, and OCB authenticates at a cost of 2 to 5%. So authenticated encryption is only 5% slower than normal encryption. So... This is really the best of all the schemes in the patent. This is the best one. But of course, every one of those patent owners claim that their patent covers also OCB. And so nobody dares to touch these things until the patents have expired. So in 2025, you can adopt OCB right in your calendars. Have to change implementations to OCB. Okay? Or maybe 2023. I haven't done the exact calculation, but this is what you'll have to do. So in fact, those schemes are less efficient than OCB and not as elegant. So I'll skip the details, but here you find the security numbers for HMAC SHA-1. So you see we can only break about half the number of rounds, which is a huge complexity. So HMAC MD4, we have an attack, which is not really practical, right? But there is an attack. And HMAC MD5, there is no real practical attack. So what about GMAC? You see a bunch of mathematics, but it's after lunch, so no mathematics today. So it's a very simple thing. It's just finite field multiplications, if you ever learned about this stuff. It's the same what's used in Reed-Solomon codes and so on. So it's very efficient. We just make some multiplications and some additions. Um, and in particular, Intel supports this multiplication. So it has an instruction for this multiplication. It's not a normal multiplication. It's a multiplication in this finite field here. But so Intel has an instruction for this, which is really cool. Um, but so. For every message which you authenticate, you have to use a new unique number, a counter or a random number. If this number repeats, then your key is gone and all your security is gone. 
So if your piece of software crashes and you reboot, and by accident you use the same nonce or counter as before, then I find your key by a simple equation. Um, I don't like this. I think it's uh, an important weakness. Second, assume you only want, say, a 20-bit authenticator. For some applications, you don't want to authenticate with 64 bits, but you only want to sh say one in a million is good enough. If you do this, I have an attack that finds your key efficiently. Okay? So there was a security proof of GCM, um, and last summer a paper was published showing that this proof is wrong. And a new proof was made. Is this correct? Let's hope it. Um, and so next week there will be another attack on um, GCM. There, will be, there are also weak keys and so on, so I'm not a big fan of GCM if you haven't figured it out by now. I think if you adopt GCM, you will in five years say, I wish I had it. That's my observation. Maybe it's not the case, and maybe the push by Intel will change things, but at least I wouldn't use it. You, Mike, I will skip. So, next point is how to use a yes. I guess I will not have time to explain to you how to use RSA, but at least I will explain to you how to use a yes. So, this turns out to be also tricky, and if you were paying attention on Monday, uh, you heard lectures about padding Oracle attacks. API attacks. So you heard about padding Oracle attacks? No? So I was in the room here, and at least the word was mentioned. <laughs> so it was shown that the, all these smart cards and all these hardware security models were vulnerable to attacks which are padding Oracle attacks. But I don't think he explained what it is. Right? So I will try to explain to you how they work. So, first, how not to use a block cipher. Well, this is what I use on my slides when I introduce block ciphers, and then I say I should never show this because you should never use a block cipher like this. I'm going to prove it to you by example. So here is a picture which I will encrypt with AES in ECB mode. One, two, three. Here is the encryption. This is, well, this is in fact not ECB mode. I'm cheating. This is a substitution cipher where I replace every pixel, every byte by a different pixel. And this is transposition mode. This is where I move pixels around. This is gamma plus encryption of football. So you can't see the ball, but you can see that there is a football game. So now I'll be really honest. This is the real encryption with AES in ECB mode. Well, I show you two encryptions. You have to say which one it is. Is it this one or this one? It's this is ECB. In fact, you don't encrypt at all, right? So if you use CBC, you get this. Well, it does, the shape doesn't change. This is just because I copied and pasted something else. But I mean, it should have the same shape, of, obviously. But. So this is CBC mode. You've all heard of CBC mode. You chain the blocks one by one. And there is a very simple advice. You should use CBC with a random and secret IV. There is a paper from 1997 even proving that if you do it with a random and secret IV, it's secure. And if your IV is not random or not secret, it's insecure. The paper is available there for everybody to read. Who uses a random and secret IV? You have a question? So can we just treat the IV as another part of the secret and be done with it? Very yes. Well, but the problem is you need a new one for every message. Well, for example, what you could do is you could maintain a counter and a second key. And for every message, you could encrypt the account to get an IV. Well, if I'm doing like just basic cryptographic storage on my credit card, I would yes. have to, I'd have to send the IV with the secret. Yes. You could also send the IV along with the message, right? It's tricky. In fact, my main advice is anyway, don't use CBC. But, so, but if you, what I'm going to point out is that if you use CBC, you should do it like this. If you don't, you have more attacks. What does SSL do? Anybody knows? SSL uses as random and secret IV the last ciphertext from the previous message. That's random. Is it secret? No. There is an attack, the beast attack, that exploits this. So the people were told about this in, in 2001. Well, in fact, the paper is 97. They were told about it in 2001. But only when a real, the real beast attack appeared that showed you could really get plain text from SSL sessions and decrypt passwords, only then did they actually start worrying about it. Okay. But it's simple cryptographic advice. It's in any textbook today, and it's completely ignored. Okay? Why? Because it's inconvenient. It's, it's inconvenient you have a random and secret IV. It's just going to be more. Every, everyone says that the, the, the IV is the 
Yes, it's wrong. No, but encrypted. That's fine. So I'll show you the attack, by the way, if IV is, uh, is known, OK? This is decryption. Nice thing is it's random access. So. Let's first explain why the IV needs to be um, at least random. Assume in a very weak case, you just don't use an IV, you just use a constant zero, right? This is the, the most lazy option, which some people do as well. And they say, yeah, we do it because in our system it doesn't matter, okay? So if you actually don't change the IV or you put zero here, then if the first block of the plain text in is the same, the, the first block of the sentence will always be the same. So in fact, if your plain text has a pattern, a beginning pattern, then this will be leaked in the ciphertext. Everybody sees that? If I always have all zeros here, I will always have the same ciphertext. So to randomize the first block, you need actually a random IV. Okay? So I hope that with this simple example, I showed that um, you need at least a random IV. Now I need to still show you why you need a secret IV. But this is, this is a bit more tricky. Then it's OK. If you change the key, then it's fine. OK? So now we have the reaction attack. So this is the padding oracle attack. This has many names. So Alice sends a message to Bob encrypted in CBC mode saying, meet me tonight at 8 o'clock at the outer market. OK? And so Eve is really curious because she's kind of jealous. And she wants to find out what Alice is sending to Bob. OK? But Eve doesn't know the key, so she can't decrypt. So what Eve does is she intercepts the ciphertext and she modifies it and she sends this to Bob. And Bob gets this. Okay. So Bob will probably say to Alice, what was this? Error. Okay. And you've all been trained as software developers. If you get a wrong result out of your decryption, if you expect, say, the all zero byte at the end or a counter at the end, it's wrong, then you post an error message. Otherwise, your boss gets very upset if you don't give pass error message to the higher layers. Okay. So you get an error message. Okay, so then Eve will keep doing this and doing this and so probably a mil maybe a million times, maybe a thousand times, maybe a hundred times, depends on the attack. And so once Bob says this is fine, she now knows the plain text. That's a padding oracle attack. So you never decrypt, but by mis mistreating the ciphertext, by changing it and asking whether or not it decrypts correctly, in the end you find the plain text. Scary, huh? Okay, so there is gazillions of those. The first one, the big one, is Bleichenbacher attack, um, 98. It requires one million chosen ciphertexts. This was reduced to a few hundred thousand. Um, and Graham Steele, who was here on Monday, who lectured about modules, actually showed that class script so that you can do it with a few thousand on all these modules. Okay, so what is the response of the SSL community? Well. In TLS 1.1, we fix it, but we don't adopt TLS 1.1. We all stay with 1.0. That's more convenient. We don't have to upgrade. And anyway, we just will reduce our error messages. And that's enough to fix the problem. So then OAP, in fact, is supposed to be better encryption. In fact, is more vulnerable. Um, then the attack was shown on SSH, then on SSL. And the one which really made impact on SSL was the one that showed how you could byte by byte extract passwords. And this is the attack which uh, was referred to on Monday, the, the padding attack by Kanvel Hilton Wodney and Huagnu, which actually allows to, by malforming ciphertext, look at the error message, just get um, plain text. So these attacks keep popping up because developers simply don't understand them. And even if you tell them use a random secret IV and use random padding, they just ignore this because it's inconvenient, right? And the, the typical answer is yes, in general, this is true, but in my case, it's not necessary. Right? Because my system is special. My plain text do and don't have a common first block. And of course, the first time they turn their back on vacation, their buddy comes in, changes the software, so the, fir the first block can be the same, or just a new application is discovered where it ha is the same. Right? So this is the problem. You want a robust encryption. So the solution is don't send error messages. 
It's not a solution, of course. It's bad software practice, so you should not do this. Um, the real solution is to use authenticated encryption. That's what we keep shouting at people. But of course, there is a patent problem, and the fact that it's slower and that it's more complex to implement. Well, so this is the other advice. Mac the ciphertext and do not decrypt if the Mac is incorrect. This is encrypt and Mac. Encrypt and Mac is the proper approach. And there is also, for example, I believe that SSH does Mac then encrypt. And this is not so good, but maybe for CBC it's okay, but then there is still an attack and whatever. So I think the, the short advice is encrypt then Mac. Um, but the real good advice, the long-term solution is dedicated encryption. And so TLS, SSH, IPsec, they should dump all their CBC mode, they should dump all their RC4, and just only allow authenticated encryption. There is no reason to use anything else today. But, but there, were, there were limitations in the, the AES versus Xamarin. And so <coughs> there's similar limitations in AES plus HMAC SHA-2 if you set the key for them? Well, I think AES plus HMAC um, is encrypt and MAC is probably slightly faster than CCM. But then you need to have actually, um, you have to have HMAC implemented as well. That's a disadvantage, I would say. So how does the attack work? I'm not sure whether I have time to explain this to you, but I may try. So essentially what I exploit is padding. And they work for any padding method, no matter what you do. So for example, SSH pads with the byte zero if there is one byte to pad, pads with 0202 if there is two bytes to pad. This is a variant. Here is just a zero padding. So assume my plain text block is 16 bytes and 16 bytes plus one byte. So I have one byte left. So what I will do to be able to encrypt is put all zeros here. So I pad this block with 15 zero bytes. Okay, and this is my plain text. Even in this case, I've used a random secret IV. It will not help me. So the attack is in decryption, okay? So what I will do is, in C2, in the middle block, I will XOR a value in the first byte, okay? Maybe some other bit, okay? So what will happen, if you look at what happens here, this block is garbled, so it will be wrong. This block is unaffected. This block is garbled because I, ch I change something here in the ciphertext. What comes out is complete nonsense. But this string will now be extra to the plain text, okay? And now my decryption routine will check, in fact, that, so the padding, so it was not, uh, I made a mistake here, I said it is all zeros, but in fact, the padding is one in this case and all zeros. So if I now change this, my padding will no longer comply, and this gives me information whether or not this is, a, this is a legal padding, will give me information on this byte P3, okay? And I keep, keep doing this and playing with changes, and see which ones work and which don't work. And no matter which padding algorithm you use, if you check validity of anything, you will get information. Okay, I didn't give you all the details, but at least the principle. So you make a local modification to a plain text byte, and then from the fact whether the modified byte still complies with padding rules or not, it gives you information on this plain text byte. And this is how these attacks work. And so they exploit the fact that in CBC, you can actually inject differences in the plain text, which are chosen by you. Okay, so there is more details on this, but I think in the interest of time, I should actually uh, skip this. So this attack actually made, exploit the fact that the plain text length in bytes is in the first block in this mode, and that so by making changes here, you can change the plain text length in bytes, actually. And so then you have an error because the real length is different from the other length, so you don't have zero bits where you expect zero bits, and then you get an error message. This allows you to find out the bits of P3. Okay, maybe it was a bit too complex, but at least now you have, you can start looking at this stuff. Okay, so maybe answer Jim's question. So what about a known IV? So assume I know one plain text here. I know the IV, so I know the ciphertext. Okay, if I now know the IV in advance, okay, I can actually check whether, and looking at the ciphertext, I know whether the plaintext is a certain value or not. I can actually use this as a kind of plaintext oracle. So I can detect whether my plaintext is a particular value. 
This is one possible variant. There is, there is several attacks, but very simply, if you know the IV in advance, you can tune the plaintext in chosen plaintext and or in chosen ciphers and get kind of information. Yes, but I think in any case, I mean, the, the, the thing people overlook is the following. Uh, it may be the fault of cryptographers. So in 1997, there was a paper published and widely advertised saying that this is the first time we study the modes operation in detail. And we're very happy to announce that CBC is provably secure if your IV is random and secret. Now, if you go read the paper, it says CBC mode is provably secure against chosen plain text attacks. But of course, all these spelling attacks are chosen ciphertext attacks. I choose the ciphertext and then look at what comes out. So in fact, it's well known that you cannot secure CBC against chosen ciphertext attacks. It is insecure. There is no secure implementation of CBC against chosen ciphertext because CBC is vulnerable to chosen ciphertext. Okay? So if your opponent can do chosen ciphertext, CBC is useless. But this message was never given or was not given loud enough. Right? They were too proud of the positive side of the result. Can you explain chosen ciphertext attack one more time quickly? Well, in chosen ciphertext attack, the, the, the most extreme variant is you have a box or, or whatever. It's, it's like you have a device and you inject ciphertext, you can look at the plain text. For example, every TLS server, SSL server, allows this because if you want to authenticate a server, you, send a ran you take a random number. You encrypt the public key of the server, you send it to the server, and the server will decrypt it for you. This is chosen ciphertext, right? You generate ciphertext and you get the answer. Okay? So the padding oracle attacks, they're also chosen ciphertext, right? But they're slightly different. So you actually inject an error. You inject an error. You don't get, even Bob should not output this value. Bob only says yes or no, this plain, this plain text is correctly formatted, starts with a length in bytes and has indeed the correct length in bytes, right? This is actually a weaker attack because you don't get the plain text, you only get information on the plain text, yes or no, it complies with the format we agreed, okay? But there is no formatting that works because in CBC you don't know where the block ends, right? So you have to give redundancy to say where the block ends. And if this information is incorrect, you can use it as an oracle. So dump CBC, okay? Dump it. Okay. Well, that's what I will say. So XML has the same problem. XML encryption, this is a more recent standard. Uh, was broken two years ago with a similar attack, 2,000 decryption queries. Um, what? Yes. Yes. The, the other thing is that if the plain text, like you said, is, is available, then you can, you can derive the ID. Yes. So most data that you encrypt has a hello message, which is incredibly predictable and well Yes. Especially if you're using XML plain text. Yes. Right? So as an implementer, you have to be very careful that you're not, you're not succumbing to that predictable, predictable plain text. It, it has to be read. I think uh, you cannot. As an implementer, avoid predictable plaintext. You should choose a cipher that resists known plaintext, chosen plaintext, and chosen ciphertext. I think that's the, the general advice. And they exist. But they're slightly more expensive and they require things like random secret IVs and, and nonsense that don't repeat and all these kind of annoying things which you don't want to have in practice. So you could potentially throw in a random cat at the beginning. Yes. So th this is what people do. This is, this is essentially what the sa this is the same, right? I mean, I didn't explain it, but of course, if you choose a zero IV and a random path value here, what you then get is the encryption of the IV and your IV is secret and random. But the problem is though that it's now output on the channel. So, in fact, th there is even worse things, right? I mean, I could go on only about CBC for another hour. So, CBC is probably secure against chosen plain text. But if you use CBC on a smart card, how does it work? Okay, you say I'm start encryption. You're given the first plain text blocks and you get the ciphertext block. Then you send the next plain text block, you get the ciphertext block. Okay? 
because a smart card cannot store a 10,000 byte message. So it will encrypt for you block by block. In this model, CBC is insecure against chosen plain text attack. So in a, we call this blockwise adaptive model, CBC is not secure. The, the fix there is actually quite easy. There is a security proof that works. What the smart card has to do is to store two blocks. So you first give one plain text block, you get nothing. Then you give a second plain text block, and now you get the first cipher text block. That works. But of course, nobody does that because that costs an extra block, right? Nobody in a sane mind will do this. Okay, so what to do? Well, use counter mode together with the Mac. Um, say Emac or CMac and counter mode together with CMac. This is CCM, okay? Um, but the real advice is use authenticated encryption. So this is what you really need for everything. Um, and this is essential for security against chosen cyber attacks, which is essential for security against padding Oracle attacks. Okay? So NIST, as I said, they prefer GCM and also CCM, which is CBC Mac or CMAC, sorry, compared with counter mode. So maybe to repeat, because I can see it is pretty confusing. So don't use CBC. And be spending Oracle attacks, which were shown to you on Monday. So essentially what they do is, with these expensive tokens, they don't give you the key, because the key is secure in the token. But what you do is you get a ciphertext, you keep playing with it, and you keep sending it to the token, and after a while you know what the plain text is. Just based on the error messages. That's essentially how these attacks work. So here again, this slide summarizes more or less the state of the art. So dump CBC mode. CCM and GCM are NIST standards, and I prefer CCM even if it's slower. There is these patented schemes which are much better, especially OCB, but good luck in the patent fight. Um, and I guess all these schemes, they have nice properties like associated data. You can authenticate packet headers, for example, without encrypting them. This is really nice. Or you can authenticate mapper data of a file without encrypting it. Um, most of them are parallelizable, not CCM. Um, they're online, they work from left to right, and most of them have a security proof. But for GCM, it turns out that the first proof was wrong. We're still looking at the second proof to see whether it holds up. So the summary for RSA is the following. For RSA, we have similar problems. So if you use RSA with PKCS number one, version 1.5, um, and also even version 2, there is padding Oracle attacks. And you've seen the proof on Monday with the API attacks. You can take all the commercially available tokens, and all of them are vulnerable to these attacks, right? You've seen, well, not all of them, but at least those that allow for certain wrapping functions are all vulnerable to these attacks. OK, so this is the sign for five more minutes. I will not, not never be able to cover everything, but let me do a few more things in my last five minutes. So I'll skip RSA, right? Unfortunately, I cannot teach you how to use it. Or maybe I should show you this one, right? This is an important one. So let's just look at the status. So factorization 768. Well, get rid of 1024. We see more and more sweet B. Okay, and the big answer, or the big question there is patents. So suite B is, suite A is classified from NSA, suite B is ECC, uh, AES, and SHA-2. Um, if you have a contract with the US government, you actually fall under the patent deal between Certicom and the US government, or I should say now BlackBerry and the US government, since RIM is now called BlackBerry. Um, but as far as I know, the Swiss government, the German government, the Austrian government use ECC, and if you're careful in avoiding certain tricks, you can actually use ECC without falling under certain competence. But I'm not a lawyer, and I not give patent advice unless I'm paid a lot of money. Right? It's too dangerous. Okay? So elliptic curves has much shorter keys compared to RSA. So RSA 2048 is about 100 bits security, while ECC you only need 200 bits, so 10 times shorter keys. So but now about generating keys, I don't know whether you guys have heard about this attack. It's really cool. So what these people did was the same as Peter Eckersley. They collected 11 million openly available keys. 
Um, and they actually obtained 6 million RSA moduli. The rest was LGML and only one was DSA. Um, so 1% of the keys occurs in more than one certificate, so they're being reused, which is not so good. And then about 13,000 moduli are easy to factor. Why? Because one key is equal to P times Q, and the other one is P prime times Q. In fact, the Q factor has been reused. And so if you compute the greatest common divisor of n and n prime to moduli, the, the factor Q pops out. So this is actually a very simple computation. And so if you have this problem, so you, you actually have low entropy in your key generation, and so you have different moduli, but they share a prime, then factoring is easy. Okay? Anybody still has enough math knowledge to see this? This is really easy math, okay? So, of course, there is even more extreme cases where the complete public key is the same. This is really stupid, but in fact, this is actually much worse because if the public key is the same, you can actually detect it. But here, you can't detect it unless you compute a GCD. There is still an interesting question. If I have 6 million keys, how do I compute 6 million squared GCDs? And this is the contribution of this paper. They show that with one big GCD, which takes um, a few seconds, they can do everything. So, in fact, this is the story behind the paper. Um, Jim Hughes, one of the authors of this paper, um, he's working for a company with a lot of servers, and he went to Leinster and said, do you have a big computation to do? And Arjen said, yes, let's take a GCD of all those keys. And then it turns out that before they did this, they found an algorithm to do it in a second. So the big computation took a second. It took them months to get the keys, but then they, found th they factored 13,000 moduli in those seconds. But there was no big computation, and that was the bad side of it. The initial goal of the project failed. So 40% of those 30,000 are valid certs. And so essentially what happens is that the key generation probably has only 40 bit of randomness. Then you expect this kind of repeats. Okay? So, and this typically means that this is generated on devices without user input. When you just boot the device, you read the clock, you take some cache data and some other stuff, and then you generate an RSA key. And of course the software assumes that there is a mouse, that there is a user that types, and that there is some action happening. But on an embedded device, after boot up, no action is happening or the same action is happening on all the devices. And so this is why you get collisions. So for LGML and DSA, of course, you will also be able to recover those keys, but it will, every time it will take you to the 40 steps. So this is harder to do, um, but it's still not infeasible. And there is more problems because in LGML and DSA, if you reuse the key, no, you're not the key, the randomness in signing, then you can also recover the key. So in RSA, the problem is in key generation. In LGML and DSA and ECDSA, the problem is in signing. So in that sense, the problem may be bigger. Okay? So then the other interesting problem is, so they found this. So how are you going to publish these results? So are you going to make all these public keys public? with the factor. So now 13,000 users are vulnerable. Or are you going to try to find certificates with email addresses and email them? And then it turns out that one of the certificates and keys belongs to a bank and the other one to a hacker. And so at this moment, you now have given the hacker the private key of the bank. So it's a really big problem. You now they found a really big thing. Um, and so then the next plan they had was, let's have an internet service where you can submit your public key and you give an answer whether or not your key is vulnerable. Can the enter decide it against it? So they were thinking of having a service where you could submit your public key and get yes or no. I mean this list or not. Okay? But in the end they decided not to do anything. So if you want to find this list, you have to write the code of Peter Eckersley, grab all the keys, then implement the algorithm of GCD, which takes one second on the laptop, and then you get the factors too. That's the only way to actually solve it. Of course, when Microsoft saw this paper, they did the same thing on their keys. I don't know the outcome. So some people, as I told you this morning, give it for the Taiwanese government, and they factored 125 keys. And I know that the researchers are now pushing this attack, and they're factoring more keys of Taiwanese citizens. And so I'm still itching to start for the Belgian keys, but the government doesn't want to give us the keys. And obviously, I would not publish the details, but they, they just decide to put their head in the sand 
If he, if he doesn't have the keys, he can't do it, right? So this is a very good defense, good approach. <laughs> Let's not know about the problem, then it doesn't exist. Yes, but it would be still, I think it would be very hard to get more than a few hundred thousand keys this way. It would be quite hard. And they have the database, right? They have it. So maybe I should threaten that if they don't give the keys in a month, I will do this and maybe then I'll get them. I don't know. So maybe as final thing, we'll, we'll uh, do quantum stuff. So I mentioned this already, if you can have a quantum computer, you can actually have exponential parallelism and you can factor. So RSA will be insecure, ECC will be insecure. A yes, there is Grover search, so you have to double your key length. So AS 128 is not okay. AS 256 is okay. And hash sizes, well, we thought it was one times one and a half, but I think we now changed our mind on this. For collisions, there is no good algorithm. For once, there is good news. So per images, it becomes a square root, but collisions is not. So as cryptographers, we're now working on Michaelese, NTRU, um, multivariate schemes. We're frankly looking for schemes which are not vulnerable to quantum computers. This is very hard. So the most recent fad is lattice-based crypto. So we hope to be ready by the time industry needs us. But if you try to get funding for this in Europe, it's very hard. And if you go to companies for funding, they say it's not my problem, this problem is only there in 10 years. Why should I worry about it now? And so it's very hard to actually get funding to do this kind of work. <coughs> Although I think it's very, very necessary. So the mistake people made is, I, I was joking this morning about the quantum computers, that in fact we had two bits in 95, three bits in 97, six in 99, and so, so since then there is no improvement. It's seven bits, seven qubits is the biggest quantum computer. But in fact, by speaking to guys in physics, it doesn't really count. What counts is how stable you can keep the photons or the whatever objects, the ions or the quantum wells or whatever technique you're being used. So in fact, once you can make, say, a few dozen together stable, you can hook them up in a big network. You can make many copies and hook them up. So the problem is to have several of them in a kind of entangled state isolate from the environment and keep them stable for more than a few nanoseconds. What they need is stable seconds. So you should not look at the size of the computer, you should look at how long they can keep it stable. Because once they can keep it more stable, they can hook up many together and just have a big one at once. Yes? Because of this problem, doesn't that mean that like 99% of a quantum computer's uh, uh, CPU power is going to be error corrected? Yes, it is. I mean, for example, this is also the reason why the seven bits can, can only be used to factor 15, which is a four-bit integer. So in fact, three of the four bits of the seven bits are used for error correction. But it seems that this problem is under control. They seem to be able to do it. So then the quantum people have some other thing to sell you, which is quantum cryptography. And they say, this is not based on any assumption. It's just secure because physics is correct. So I think a more correct statement is that quantum cryptography works if the laws of quantum physics are correct, which we don't know anyway, we can't prove. Just like we can't prove that factoring is hard, we don't know whether quantum physics is correct, right? Um, so essentially these people have two problems. One, their systems are vulnerable to side channel attacks and other kind of hacks where you shine back photons and whatever. So in fact, even if they sell you proven secure devices, um, there is a Norwegian research group which a couple of years ago bought all the available components and broke all of them. Okay, then they have a small problem as well that they solve the wrong problem. The real problem on the internet today is authentication. How do I know who I'm talking to? And how do I know that data is correct? Quantum crypto does only, authentic, do only encryption. So it only does point to point channels. It doesn't have the public key equivalent. So it's private channels, which is good for niche applications, but not for real applications. Okay, so I will not teach you how to use RSA, we'll just wrap up. So the same problems happen, all these kind of issues. So what to use, so at least I have some slides what to use. Use authenticated encryption. Use RIPMD160 for legacy SHA-2, and I should add SHA-3 here. Okay, I should have updated this. 
For RSA, the proper way of using public key encryption is RSA CAMDAM, which is kind of a new method, which is uh, only eight years old. And in fact, which is much better than anything else. Or use ECIES. This is based on up to curves. For signing, use RSA PSS. Please don't use PKCS number one, version 1.5. Okay, it cannot be broken, but it's also not secure. It's in the gray zone, or ECDSA. And so I guess use the higher versions of the protocols as available, because the old ones have too many flaws. Okay, so remember, crypto cannot solve your problems, only move them. Okay, so I hope I showed you that crypto is kind of shaky in the sense that, you know, things get broken all the time. For example, last year there was a new attack on SSL based on fragmentation issues. The fact that on the internet your packets can be fragmented, this again imposes new conditions on the security or new requirements on the condition of encryption. So encryption without fragmentation may be secure. If you have a network with fragmentation, it may be insecure. Okay? So I still understand that most systems have many other failure modes than crypto modes, the crypto stuff. But on the other hand, if your crypto is broken, you're really in deep trouble, okay? So, and I guess the other thing is, you can't create trust with cryptography, no matter how much you use. You actually have to anchor your cryptography in existing trust relationships, okay? So I think by now I talked enough and you deserve your coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs>